<laughs> my name is Todd Ulysio, and my wife Rebecca and I own and operate Two Bear Farm just west of Whitefish. And this year I decided to have a little fun with the presentation. Uh, the topic this year is how to garden like a farmer. So, why does, does it seem that some people have a great garden every year and other people struggle? Is it an underlying problem such as the soil in your garden or is it the microclimate that you live in? Is it a difference in the level of care and diligence that one person might put into their garden versus somebody else? Is it a gift endowed by the heavens? <laughs> yes. Is there such a thing as a green thumb? Right? Are some people just better at growing food than other people? Are good gardeners born or are they made? I would argue that anyone can become a successful gardener so long as you're willing to learn the basics, learn to observe and problem solve, and you're willing to work at it over the course, the entire course of a growing season. And really, over the course of many growing seasons. But, before I start, I have a disclaimer. It's actually a long disclaimer. <laughs> Successful gardening is very contagious. Right? It not only provides you a source of fresh, nutritious food, which is not very easy to find in our current food system, but it's also a tangible, grounding, cathartic, and rewarding activity. It connects us with the land and the natural cycles, but I can't be responsible for where it leads. And I will use my own personal experience as a case in point. Right? Step one, you catch the gardening bug, right? You may be born into it, right? Your parents may garden, maybe you were raised on a farm. Maybe you get to it through food. You like to cook, you're looking for quality ingredients, and it leads you to want to grow your own. Maybe you frequent farmer's markets and you see all the wonderful produce and you think you want to grow some of that. Or maybe you go out and do a farm tour or go see uh, someone else's garden and you realize, wow, I want to be a part of that. So that's step one. Step two, you go home and you rototill your entire backyard. <laughs> and then you start to dabble in gardening. <laughs> Step three, you learn that every open space is just waiting for a project related to gardening. <laughs> Before I became a farmer, this was my house. Both of these are pictures. My backyard in Missoula, my house in Missoula, you look at the back of the garage and you think, wow. I'm going to build a greenhouse there, right? Because it's self-facing white. Right? <laughs> Step four, you have some success, right? Very dangerous when you start to have a good garden, right? You realize you like gardening more than your job. So then you quit your job and you go and get a job on a farm. Step five, you meet a cute girl who also wants to farm. And then you start a small farm. So our first farm up in Eureka was Ten Lakes Farm, and literally it was no bigger than the size of a garden. Step six, work really hard, have some success, and make your farm bigger. This is that same farm five years later. Step seven, repeat step six. <laughs> work hard, have some success, Make your garden bigger. This is us now. Ten years later, right? Voila. That's your garden. So, that was all my disclaimer. Just be careful with what I'm about to tell you. Throughout our farm journey, we have been approached by many frustrated gardeners, right? Endless topics. My goal today is to share with you some of the important techniques that we use as farmers that you could use to improve your garden. And it's by no means a comprehensive discussion, but some simple advice based on our experience. And so let's start with what I would call the big three, right? For many folks, gardening consists of one month of crazed, hectic excitement in the spring, followed by three months of garden neglect, right? And I know, the river was calling, and it was a beautiful day in Glacier. I get it. Issue number two, 
in your excitement as gardeners, you plant all of your crops all at once, right? It's one big push. Regardless of what the plant needs to grow or how cold tolerant it might be. Issue three, similarly, in your excitement, you plant all your crops all at once. Not thinking that that means they're all gonna be ready all at once. So if you're growing storage carrots, not a big deal. They're just gonna go into the garage and you can eat them over a period of months. But what about the head lettuce you planted, right? What are you gonna do with 24 heads of lettuce when they're all ready on the same day? So, to answer issue one, right, that crazy excitement followed by three months of neglect, it brings up an old Zen proverb. You should sit in meditation for 20 minutes every day, unless you're too busy. Then you should sit for an hour. <laughs> if your life is so busy in the summer that you can't get in the garden, then that's even more reason for you to get into the garden. I know you came here for tricks at the trade. I'm talking about human psychology, but I feel like it's a good place to start, right? Gardening can be expensive. It can be time consuming, especially if you don't get a good harvest off of all your work. So you really need to answer that question up front. Am I committed to gardening? Does it produce joy for me or does it only produce stress? Would you be better off using that money to shop at a farmer's market or to buy a CSA. Did you have a question? Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so that's a question to ask. Hopefully, I hope you decide to garden, but I should bring that up. If you do decide that you're committed to gardening, one, you need to be realistic about how much time you have and how much food you need, and then scale your garden appropriately. Right? The second step is figure out ways to work smarter not hard, right? Identify the most time-consuming tasks that you face in your own unique garden. Weeding, irrigation, planting, harvest, right? And then try to maximize your efficiency in those areas that you could consider bottlenecks. Issue two, in your excitement as gardeners, you plant all your crops at once, and you don't pay attention to what each individual crop needs. A potential solution to that, one is educate yourself or ask a farmer when to plant different crops. Seed catalogs are a wealth of information on this topic, and there's also a great book out there, The Gardener's A to Z Guide to Grow. But I'm going to go back to the seed catalog issue for one second. This is a clip for on the cauliflower page of the High Mowing Seeds catalog for this year. Right? Below this is all the different seeds you can buy, but there's this great info right up there that tells you a lot about every crop. This one tells you about uh, how many days to maturity from the time that you transplant it, uh, if you direct seed it, how long before you plant it out should you seed it, can it withstand a light frost, is it cold hardy, lots of good information in there, right? So read your seed catalogs. Another thing here that I noticed is, please see planting chart on page 111. So I went to page 111, and wow, that's a lot of information right there. I don't know if you can read it all. But for every crop, it lays out how far apart should I space it, how deep should I plant the seed, how far apart should my rows be, am I better off seeding it into the soil, which is called direct seeding, or should I transplant it out from starts? What soil temperature does it do best in? Uh, when should I start my transplant in the greenhouse or in your house before I put it out into the field? And when do I plant it out? And that's the key one, right? Is it after the last frost? Is it as soon as the soil can be worked? After the last hard frost? Uh, lots of different options. You'll notice all at the same time is not on that list. <laughs> so, second potential solution. When you're planting your garden, separate all your crops into two different categories. Those that are frost sensitive 
and those that are frost tolerant, because you're going to handle those differently. Third, understand what the frost patterns are in your neighborhood, right? your microclimate. Remember, the average last frost date in the flathead is June 10th, right? While frost tolerant plants can withstand a freeze, if you plant out before that, frost sensitive plants cannot. And every year I have gardeners come to me and brag that it's April and they've already gotten their tomatoes in the ground, right? <laughs> and then in May, those same people come back and they lament that all their tomatoes died and that they froze, right? Greenhouses love these people because they have to buy tomatoes three times a <laughs> season. Really good for sales. If you want an early start with your garden, that's fine, but just understand that you need to protect those plants, otherwise you risk losing them all. And the easiest way to protect plants is by using what's called season extension. So, one thing you may not think of as a season extension idea, but it is, is to plant your crops in an indoor environment to start them, right? Seed them in the flats, and then only move them outside once the conditions outside are favorable. And this allows the plant to get a jump. If you had to wait until the conditions outside were favorable before you seeded into the soil, you're going to be much further behind, right? You don't need a greenhouse to do this, although greenhouses are great. You know, it could be as simple as a rack with some lighting. And I know you're going to ask, what about my windowsill? I always start my plants on the windowsill, right? Well, windowsills are okay, but the problem with them is the light is not strong enough in a windowsill. And your little seeds grow into these long, leggy plants, and those plants are not going to grow up to have a very successful start, right? You want a plant that grows slowly and gets kind of stout and healthy, so when it moves out into the real world, it's ready to survive. So, how do you remedy that, right? Use lights. Well, what if I don't want to buy fancy grow lights? It's a lot of money. I would argue for the home gardener, you don't need fancy lights. You could go to the local hardware store or Home Depot and buy a fluorescent shop light. They're like $15 maybe put a T5 light bulb in them that has a natural spectrum and you're in your business. The one key though is you can also grow leggy plants with lights if you don't do it properly. The key to this is bringing the light down so that it's barely above those plants when they first germinate. As that plant starts to grow, you will move that light up accordingly to give it more room. But if you set your light way up high initially, the little seeds that come up are going to do this, right? So that's one of your tricks. Move that light up and down, basically up as the plant grows. So what should you start out with? I would say four to five inches maybe above the tray. And what type of ball? Can you, a fluorescent well, the, no. fluorescents, there's T12s, which are the big thick ones. There's T5s that are smaller. We've always used T5 lamps. Any one of them is fine. <laughs> um, they have different spectrums of light. There is a natural spectrum or daylight spectrum, and that's what we go with. Do you leave them on 24 hours, the light? No. We try to mimic natural conditions. Mm -hmm. And then remember also, when you plant your seeds, Different crops have different germination, days to germination. So let's say uh, a head of lettuce takes six days to germinate, right? You don't need to have the lights on for the first six days because the seed is still buried in the soil. It's only until it germinates and the plant starts to come out that you would turn your light on. And you could run it 8, 10, 12 hours a day um, and then shut it off at night. But the temperature has to be the right. To germinate, it needs to be right, but if it's in your home, you're probably fine. I'm thinking about my garage. Right. Garage, you have two things you could do. If you don't want to heat your garage, you can buy a heat mat, which goes underneath the tray. You plug it in, and then it has a thermostat, and you can keep it 60, 70, 80 degrees. They come to fit two trays or four trays. So look up heat mat. What if, what if 
what if you're not doing huge gardens, but say patio gardens, and you just want a variety, but you get seeds, you have a zillion of any one kind of thing. Is there any way to get a few seeds selectively of different kinds? Uh, I know, of course, you can wait for farmer's market and get in a nice little seedling that's grown. That's one thing. Yeah, I was about to say, I mean, one option is to buy the plant one at a time. You know, if it's 250 for one plant versus 250 for 100 seeds, but you don't know what you're going to do with the 100 seeds, right. it's an option. Um, you could ask around, get a friend to order all the cool seeds for the year, and then ask him for like three seeds from each package. <laughs> yeah. 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 Another thing to consider if you're going to do transplants is that you have to pay attention to the roots. You want to look at that seeding chart, which tells you how many weeks before you're planting out should I start inside. Right? You want your seed, you want your roots to be established, those upper two pictures, established, but not where they've grown so much that they're all bound up on each other or coming out the bottom of the pot. Sure. And the reason for that is when you transplant those upper two into the soil outside, the roots can just keep growing and enter the soil and you don't have much transplant shock, right? They get off to a good start. If you take a plant like that and put it in the ground, the roots don't go out into the soil, they just continue to tangle on each other and get root bound, right? And so this plant is going to shock and it's going to sort of stall out in its growth until the roots finally figure that they need to go out into the soil. What do you think of, my mother used to say, when you get a plant like that, break up the roots and crack it. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Some plants you can get away with that but a lot of plants are sensitive to that root disturbance. Mm -hmm. Cucumbers and squash, for instance, if you do that and watch it, within 10 minutes that plant is wilting and drooped over. Mm -hmm. So some plants are sensitive, others are not. I would say you could, if you have this, then yeah, maybe kind of finesse it a little bit to do it, but a better, uh, best practice would be to try to get roots that look like that. Another form of season extension is protective covers for your plants. And the reason I put this picture up is there are actually four versions of protective covers in this one. <coughs> we have field beds covered with what's called a floating row cover with hoops. These are only about three feet tall, six feet wide, right? So you have to pull them off in order to deal with the crop. In the background, we have hoop houses, which I'll talk about in a minute, which are six feet tall, 12 feet wide, and have a film covering on them. Probably not something you're gonna do as a gardener, but farmers use is just another scale of that, which is called a high tunnel, 12 feet tall, 26 feet wide, 96 feet long. All they do, they all do the same thing. They provide a microclimate underneath that cover that's warmer than the ambient temperature outside. If you have a frost, the frost settles on the fabric rather than on the leaves of the plants. So, this is the single most, oh, here's another picture. So this is Ten Lakes Farm, same thing, right? In that field you can see row cover on some crops, hoop houses on other crops, high tunnels on the background, right? We live in Montana. One of the biggest issues we face is a short growing season season extension is the solution to many of your issues. So I, I've got one question in regards to when you started the presentation and you gave all the options about growing and becoming a farmer or whatever. Well, the one thing that you didn't put in there that I wonder about and I have been wondering about in our valley here is what about water quality and how does it play a role in the, the, the materials we're growing, vegetables or whatever? I haven't found that water quality plays a significant role. I mean, we use both well water, which obviously is uh, potable, so it doesn't have bacteria. A pH can be really high. Um, we also irrigate out of the Stillwater River, and I wouldn't say that of all the things that are going to cause you issues gardening, I would say that water is probably not one of them. <coughs> So, floating row cover, right? Probably the single most important tool we use, 
right? Really one of the most important things in our success. Floating row cover is a spun polypropylene. So water can get through it. It comes in a variety of different weights and they go by number of, that's based on how much light is allowed through or excluded. So you can get really thin covers that prevent they let 80% of the light through. Oh, look, Rebecca's got an example. I think Laura brought it. But. There you go. So that's called floating row cover. Some people call it Rene. Um, it might let 20% of the light, or exclude 20% of light. Others, it's heavier. It allows 60% of the light through. The heavier the weight, the more uh, warmth that it provides, that it can hold. The lower temperatures that it can handle. How would you pronounce that name? What three? Rime is one variety. Some people call it Agrabon. Those are trade names. Floating row cover is the generic name. You have a preference from what you work with? We order ours custom from a company called Mechanical Transplanter. And they make it themselves and they can make it to any size that we need. So we can custom order it to the width that we use. This is a really simple method because you basically can go to your hardware store and buy half inch conduit, metal conduit, it's called EMT. It used to be about a dollar fifty per piece, now it's up to like two twenty five a piece. You bend it into a hoop. You don't have to cut it, you use the ten foot length, bend it into the hoop. Uh, Johnny Seeds in Maine sells a hoop bender for fifty dollars or if you want to come out to the farm we have one bolted to the picnic table. You can come bend takes a couple seconds to bend a hoop, stick the hoops in the ground, you put your row cover over the plant, and then you bury the edges either with dirt or a little bit easier what we use are sandbags filled with sand just to weight the edges down. <coughs> the reason I put this picture up is this is a true story from back when we were in Eureka. We outgrew our farm and we had a neighbor north of town in a warmer climate who said why did you come up here and plant all your squash on my property so rebecca and i went up there and we made our beds and we planted all our winter squash and then we broke out our hoops and our row cover and he came out and he said whoa, whoa, whoa you don't need to do that we're much warmer up here than where ten lakes farm is you don't need row cover and we just kind of smiled and said that's great but like this is the way we do it so we're going to use it well when we made our beds we didn't match the bed length exactly right to the length of row cover that we had. And so at the end, we had about three plants at the end of every row that were sticking out in the space. And so they didn't get covered, right? So we planted everything, we covered it. Our friend Bill watered it for a couple of weeks. About three weeks later, we went back up to check on our squash and Bill came out into the field with us. And he wanted to see what the progress was. And when we flipped that cover open, he saw that that's what the plant looked like inside the real cover. And that's what the plant looked like outside in the real world, right? They started as the same size. They were planted on the same day, right? They were equivalent, right? That benefited from just having warmer air held under that cover for a big portion of the day. And not getting cold that night. And that's a frost sensitive plant. So were it to have frosted sometime in that three weeks, this would have had a better chance of surviving with the cover, whereas that would have certainly have died. So would you say to use those like May and June? Well, May and June, it depends where you are in the valley, <laughs> July sometimes, and then, well, then the fall frost might come in August yeah. or September, so they're good to have around. Um, the other huge benefit of row cover is that it also excludes insects, right? So you're getting double duty here, right? Some covers we keep on for longer in the summer, not due to the risk of frost, but because we have bug issues that we're trying to deal with and in an organic system where we can't use pesticides, floating row cover is one of your best uh, practices. I guess I missed it, but it'll let the, if you keep them on, it'll let the light in enough for the plant to grow? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So these covers came on and sat for three weeks. They never got pulled off. 
You didn't have to pull them off during the day. You just left them on. The only time that could become an issue is if it is July, the temperature's 90 degrees, it can get too hot underneath them. But in May and June, it typically isn't an issue. So like when you're trying to grow greens in July, August, a shade cover it must be different material then? Yep. So this is letting light through and keeping it warmer. Mm -hmm. Shade cloth is much more open fabric. It is absorbing the light and the heat and keeping it cooler underneath. Right? Because lettuce doesn't want the hot temperatures. Right. So two, two different products. And what would you recommend for shade cover? I don't talk about shade cover, but it's it's just shade fabric. I don't know any of the names, but you can same thing. You can buy it on different weights of how much light it lets through, whether fifty percent or thirty percent. We typically don't use much shade fabric because where we're at is a cold enough climate. We might be able to benefit from it a little bit for lettuce, but the cost of it doesn't really seem to justify the expense. Whereas row cover definitely, um, the benefit is worth it. So, same concept as floating row cover, but the next scale up would be a hoop house, right? Hoop houses are a very cost effective and easy to build structure, right? You basically go to the hardware store again, you buy a pieces of inch and a half PVC pipe, which comes in a 20-foot piece, right? You cut some uh, rebar, four-foot pieces. You pound it two feet into the ground so that two feet is sticking up. You space it four feet apart down each side. Uh, I find I'm six feet tall. I don't want to have to stoop when I'm going underneath the hoop house. So that equates out to about 12 feet wide for the structure. So you're pounding a row of Rime 12 feet apart, two rows 12 feet apart, four feet between each stick. You take that pipe, you basically just slip it over each end, and then in order to solidify it, you make some purlins out of more pipe and you just electrical tape it in place. Really easy. Then you would buy film, not row cover, which is a woven porous cover. This is greenhouse film, which has to be UV treated, don't go out to the hardware store and buy this queen, which does not have a UV protectant because that stuff will turn yellow and disintegrate into a billion little pieces of plastic. This fabric's UV treated, it's called six mil four year film. Not very expensive. Uh, we typically buy a 50 foot piece of the fabric that's 24 feet wide and that will make a hoop house that's 12 feet wide by 48 feet long. It's about $500 for the structure. Uh, you put one up in a couple hours. They typically last at least five years. The film will last five years. The pipe will last a billion, probably. Um, but you're talking $100 a year for basically a growing structure that's 575 square feet. So that's a lot of room. You can grow almost an entire garden under one structure, depending on how much food you're growing for. So when do you put that up? Is that we put, up we put that up as soon as the, we can get in the ground and it's not muddy, right? And then if it snows again later on, it's protected. It helps the soil dry out faster. So it doesn't hurt to have it up as soon as you can. And how late do you leave it up? Uh, we take it down last thing in the season after the crop is dead, but we always, we, went, we don't use these anymore, but we use them for 10 years. We would put them up every year and take them down every fall. You could try to leave them up in the winter, but I don't recommend it. What was the plastic that you used called again? It is called greenhouse film, okay. six mil, M-I-L, six mil, four year film, UV treated. And again, lots of different manufacturers of that. But if you look in a greenhouse magazine, you can find it. I just have a silly question, but for like the frost cover, a previous example, you used PVC pipe. Frost right. cover before was the metal half inch conduit that you can buy at Home Depot. Could Stick you? it in the ground, no rebar required, no 
Perlin's required. It's, it's just, cheaper that way. Uh, yeah. I just wonder why you can use PVC. Could you use PVC for the other version? You and could. It, you could. You had access to those materials. You could. Yeah. Okay. The reason we use metal is it's more rigid, okay. so it doesn't require the purlins. Okay. A structure like this, you put up in the spring, you take down in the fall. Right. On our farm, the metal hoops, we might put them out for two weeks and then move them to another bed and then move them to another bed. Okay. So we don't want a structure that's all taped together okay. with purlins. Uh -huh. That's why we use metal. Gotcha. Um, are these hoop houses pretty easy to put up and take down? Yeah, the biggest issue with this, the way we do it, is that along the edges, right, we dig, the reason we buy, we have a 20 foot long piece of pipe that's bent, right, but we buy plastic that's 24 feet wide, right, so you have two feet of extra plastic. We dig a trench down the outside edge, and we put that plastic in it, and we backfill it with dirt, so it's held in place from the width. Right? The hardest part of putting one of these up is digging that trench and burying your plastic. Some people skip that step by just stringing rope back and forth over the top mm -hmm. to hold it in place. It's called a caterpillar tunnel, um, which you can look up online. I've never done that technique. Rebecca really loves it in the spring to take the new crew out and dig <laughs> trenches for like two days. It's like our introduction to farm. <laughs> Issue three, planting all of your crop all at once, which means it's all ready all at once, right? You look at that and you go, wow, I wish my garden looked like that. Like that's something to be proud of. Look at all that head lettuce. Until you realize you're one guy and all that stuff is ready right now. <laughs> like what are you gonna do with all that stuff? You know, three quarters of that is gonna bolt or go bad before you can get to it, right? Now this, this isn't as good for your ego, but this is a much more practical way to plant, right? The solution to this problem is called plant successions. You're not planting all at once. You're planting multiple times throughout the season. On our farm, we're planting every week of the season, right? Different crops, different stages. In this example, at the top, you have seeds that are just germinating. Next row down is probably seeds that were planted a week earlier, which are like putting on their true leaves. Then a week earlier there was a row seeded and that's starting to bulk up and that's bulking up. And this row, which was probably planted five weeks earlier, you're eating this right now, right? So you have this staggered harvest. Same exact amount of space. This you have about a week to eat all that and then it's done. Here, you're gonna be eating off of this for months, right? Now, you don't have to just plant one row. Just think about how much food you want in a week, right? Maybe you're doing five rows per planting a week apart, right? How much food do you want? You're not limited to one row, is my point. Planting successions is something farmers do all the time, but gardeners, that I've bumped into, it's not a concept that they typically think about, right? Yes, it means you can't just plant your garden all at once and you're gonna have to have it on your calendar to plant every once in a while, but I think it's worth it. So, I've covered the big three. One other issue I thought of was you know, hey, when I plant my seeds in the garden, they don't germinate. Nothing comes up, right? We hear that a lot. Well, there's a lot of reasons that that could be. One is the seed is old or it's low quality, so the germination rate is low. For every one seed you put in the ground, or every 10 seeds you put in the ground, maybe only three germinate. The other ones are not viable. Uh, another issue is that your seed is buried too deep or it's too shallow, right? If it's too deep, it's not warm enough, or when it germinates, it doesn't have enough energy in the seed to get up through the soil. If it's too shallow, it may germinate, but it's exposed to the sun, and it cooks in the sun, and you don't see anything. Again, look at your planting chart. If you remember, it told you the planting depth for each crop. 
that's where that comes in handy. It tells you how deep the plant your seed. <coughs> One thing we've run into is rodents eat your seed. As soon as you seed it, they come in at night and they eat all the seed out of the ground. And you don't know that until a month later when you're wondering where your spinach should be and there's nothing there, right? Well, how do I deal with that? You can try to trap the rodents you know, throughout the season or you can plant transplants. Okay. So transplants are a season extension technique, but they also help you with this issue. Another issue, or another reason, is that seed is undergoing or experiencing harsh conditions, right? A lot of times what happens is you're planting out and there's still frost occurring. The plants germinate, they're tiny little babies. As soon as they come out of the ground, there's a frost that night and they freeze out and they disappear and you can't tell whether they came up or not and they're never going to come up, right? So they've germinated and died. Another thing that can get them is the ground is too wet and the seed rots. The ground is too dry so the seed can absorb moisture and expand. Or both. They're really wet one time, then it gets really dry. Really wet, the plant germinates, then it's really dry and it cooks in the sun. My point being, you want to try to keep consistent moisture on a seed up until the point that it germinates. Another thing you can do, if it is freezing that's getting your seeds, that floating row cover is a great way to keep the environment where your seed is warmer and to protect it from frost. So a lot of times we'll seed beds of whatever it is, salad mix, carrots, even though the plant's not up, we'll set our hoops and we'll put our row cover on it, right? And then we'll water it. Another issue. My plants don't mature in time to yield a good harvest before they freeze. I am lobbying the state of Montana to make the green tomato our state fruit. <laughs> Is that your priority? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it gets at my solution. If all your garden crops freeze before you get a harvest, you have two options. Three options. You can move somewhere warmer. I wish that was my friend. You can use season extension techniques that I already mentioned. Grow in a hoop house, use floating row cover, right? Try to get that climate a little bit more favorable for your plant. Another trick is when you're going through the seed catalog, you'll see every plant, every variety has a days to maturity.